All right. I'm just going to go because it, it explains itself. Newton's cradle is a device that illustrates the converse conservation of momentum and energy. It's a hypnotic toy of five steel balls. When one sphere at the end is lifted and released, it strikes the stationary sphere transmitting a force through the other stationary spheres that pushes the last sphere forward. One of my college professors had one on his desk, and he showed me something interesting one day. He said, if you only see half of the device, it looks like one sphere is behaving erratically. It's only by expanding your view that you understand cause and effect. I've been thinking about that lately, given the current climate, and I ask myself, can I gain a wider perspective when what I want to do is fade away? My wanting to withdraw could be interpreted as indifference, but I don't think it is. None of us are born indifferent. It's a protection, a shield against being scorned, laughed at, or singled out for having intense emotions. My protective shield of indifference was first planted when my parents divorced. It became clear in the ensuing chaos that us kids were on our own to figure it out. This was the era when many said, they're just kids. When they fall, they bounce. The first real episode that made me aware of this ideology happened when I had strep throat. But that story is for another time. This is about a time when I made the decision that I didn't matter. It was the summer between seventh and eighth grade. I was 11 and the youngest in our collective of friends. Kathy had turned 12 in February, Linny in March, Cindy, pronounced Cindy, it's a long story and I'll get to it, in April, and Kathy had turned 12 way back in January. Just to point out, we had to work out how to address Kathy with a K and Kathy with a C, but I'll get to that too. I wasn't to turn 12 until the last golden week of summer. I was comforted knowing that I would be 12 at the start of eighth grade. I had that going for me. At this point, I was the flat-chested, lanky one of the group. Two summers earlier, after the dust had settled from the long and messy divorce of my parents, my mother drove us halfway across the country to sunny Southern California. At this time, I was nine years old, and I knew for my mother, this was a new beginning, a chance to escape the gossip of righteous relatives and the Catholic community in which we lived. Somewhere along that long, hot drive from Minnesota, past the Rocky Mountains, Las Vegas, and into the basin of Los Angeles, any rules guiding our family completely evaporated. My mother's newfound freedom would set in motion disruptive consequences, and at the time, blame was placed squarely on us kids for behaving badly, acting out, and causing trouble. My older brother, already in rebel mode during the divorce, Cost the brunt, caught the brunt of it, much like that fifth wheel and fifth steel ball in Newton's cradle. We moved to California because the University of Southern California granted my mother a full scholarship to complete her master's degree in English literature. It was the 1960s, and universities were looking for older students that made a positive impact. As an intelligent, newly divorced woman seeking a profession, she was an excellent candidate. We arrived a week before school started and rented a house in Palos Verdes Estates. My older sister and brother enrolled at Palos Verdes High School. My younger brother went to Lunata Bay Elementary and I was placed at Margate Intermediate. That first year was a shock. A Midwest family settling into a wealthy California community, putting it mildly, we stuck out. Our shoes, hair, and clothes gave us away. Hard-soled shoes, fall-colored sweaters, and done hair were the essentials of living in the Midwest. But foreign in the land of canvas vans, tropical-colored shirts, and long, straight hair. After the first day of school, I never rolled my hair or wore a saddle shoe again. I caught it from my mother that I wouldn't wear my saddle shoes as she paid good money for them. But how could I explain what she didn't understand? The streets 
curved and twisted gently in Palos Verdes estates, not the hard right and left angles of which I had known. School friends Cindy and Linny lived down the street, kitty corner from, from one another. Their houses hid behind great walls of greenery. In the Midwest, homes were decorated with flower beds, cheerfully greeting visitors and passers-by. Front doors proudly stood in the center of the house with wide front porches to protect people from the weather when arriving and to offer a place to sit and enjoy a cool summer night or watch a thunderstorm. Behind the houses were alleys where children of every age played every game possible. Touch football, basketball, baseball, capture the flag and kick the can were occasionally interrupted by cars as fathers returned from work to park inside garages not attached to the house. Old barns repurposed to protect cars from winter ice and summer hail. In Palos Verdes, garages were the focal point. Overgrown jasmine bushes and eucalyptus trees dominated the sides of each house. And I remember getting the feeling of, do not come any closer from these houses. When Linny offered to walk me to school, I waited for her in the driveway. The first year in California passed in a blur. By seventh grade, I gained acceptance in the preteen community. Singing in chorus greatly helped my integration. An eighth grade boy, Brad Starr, yes, he looked exactly as his name sounded, sat next to me and word got out he liked my singing voice and said I was funny. At the time, I was oblivious to his feelings. In my mind, why would he like me? Beverly Kincaid, also in chorus, also in eighth grade, was the girl every boy liked. She had long skinny legs, blonde hair, and wore white lipstick. Nevertheless, his nod to my singing and sense of humor gave the tip to my acceptance. Our collective of girlfriends had expanded to include Tina and Kimberly. Calling out Kathy or Kathy became confusing and Tina would add Kathy with a K or Kathy with a C when addressing either. Cindy suggested Kathy add her middle name and be called Kathy Ann. Kathy said she'd rather die. Ann was her mother's name, so, you know, gross. Kathy, with her practical mathematical mind, said, oh, just call me Kath. And that was settled. And as to Cindy and the spelling of her name, I asked her once when we hiked up the dirt trail to school. Her mother and father thought they were unable to have children, and they fostered a girl, her older sister, Monica. Three years later, much to their delight and surprise, they got pregnant. Convinced it was a boy, they settled on Sydney, a nod to their Australian homeland. And being rather hard-headed when he turned out to be her, they named her Cindy, pronounced Cindy. Finally, the school year ended and the beach with sun and surf and boys beckoned. But first, we needed new bathing suits. It meant only one thing a trip to the Peninsula Shopping Center. With $20 burning in my pocket from babysitting and cleaning houses, all that was needed was a ride. Turned out by Kath's older brother and Tina's mother, Linny bit the bullet and asked her mother for the second time. She agreed with the stipulation that we were given one hour to shop. She would take us when she did her grocery shopping, and if we weren't at the car in time, she'd leave. None of us wore wristwatches, so how we were to keep an eye on the time wasn't discussed. We were just happy to be going. Kath, being both mathematical and practical, every so often asked the sales lady the time. Even with that, we were five minutes late returning to the car. Luckily, the market was crowded that day, and Linny's mother, ever the social butterfly, sat on one of the outdoor benches and chatted with friends. We waited for her 20 minutes, but hey, no harm, no foul. All of us bought two-piece bathing suits except Linny. She felt she was too fat for a two-piece and got a pretty one-piece with a small skirt around her hips. My suit was a Hawaiian floral pattern in sage green and ivory. I remember it cost $12.99, a fortune back then. 
but it was well made and it fit me perfectly. So Kath told me I couldn't pass it up. The next hurdle was to give it past my mother before she coveted at hers. I mean, she'd already taken over a navy blue dress and a pair of dark green suede shoes my grandmother sent me for Christmas. So I felt justified in being cautious. I hid it between the box springs and mattress until I could wear it to the beach. When she found it in the laundry basket, she hit the roof that I dare buy, and more importantly, wear a two-piece to the beach. There were threats to return it. Fortunately, I had already baptized it in the Pacific Ocean. There was nothing that could be done. I suspected, however, by how she threw the suit in my face that she tried it on, but it didn't fit. So it was mine now. That's 1,500 words, so. <laughs>